redeeming the rainbow. In light of what's happening in our culture today, I would like to speak concerning this topic. I believe it's not political. I believe it's biblical values that are being scorned and that are being mocked today in our culture. Now what our culture does is, is culture. But the moment that begins to infiltrate the lives of people, and especially people in the church, I believe as Christians, we need to speak God's truth in love. Warning, um, this is not suitable for children. I'm going to sanitize this as much as I can. But at the same time, I do want to let you know that demonic agenda is after our children. There is an emphasis on hijacking children today by indoctrinating them at the young tender age as well as taking them and their minds, their precious minds. Children are like wet cement. They're very impressionable and when you begin to sow seeds into their mind through what Disney does today, in fact one of the engineers and one of the people that decides the programming flat out said we have, it's no secret, an agenda to fill as much of queerness into our programming as we can. Our entertainment for children. What's happening today in our government, what's happening today, first time that I remember got thrown off from social media, it was because I mentioned that your gender is not decided but it's discovered. And I quickly got labeled as somebody who is prov provoking aggression and provoking violence against an alphabet community. We are in the place today where if you believe the truth and you speak the truth, you will be deplatformed, you will be demonetized, you will be silenced, or you will be called with names that no Christian ever want to carry those labels and those names. The benefit that I have is we came from former Soviet Union. My great ancestors sat in jail for 10 years and they got physically beaten for believing the truth of the gospel. So losing my TikTok account is not very scary. Now, the second thing I want to highlight, I am in any way, nor is our church, hates or does not love or welcome people who don't believe what we believe or who don't practice Christianity. Our church exists for Christians but everyone who is not a believer, who lives a different lifestyle is always welcome. They, they're welcome to this church, they're welcome to worship and hear about Jesus Christ. But one thing that we don't do is we don't change the Bible to fit our culture, to be accepted by our culture and to be loved by our culture. Jesus says if everybody speaks well of you, it's not good for you. We don't want to be applauded by a culture that is under the influence of demons and then stand before God and be rejected by our Jesus because we stood with the world instead of with Him. Amen. In the beginning what happened is when humanity came under the spell of the devil, we did two things in Adam. We rebelled against God and we redefined good and evil. When we rebelled against God, meaning God is no longer the final authority who decides what's good for us. He's not our Lord and He's not our boss. And see anytime you get rid of God, you act like God. And as God, you begin to make rules as you go. This is right and this is wrong. This is good and this is bad. And the culture has been redefining good and evil since then. Israel, a nation that God has chosen to be a nation that represents Him, a nation that's supposed to give birth to the Son of God who will save the world. That nation, as you would study in the Old Testament, constantly was tempted with God's of the nations. Gods of Canaanites, Amorites and Moanites and all of the parasites, not parasites, parasites, they were parasites too. And then Philistines and all of the other ites. These nations had few things in common. A lot of them had idols that they worshipped and in their worship of idols they always mixed sex with idolatry. If you look at the history of the paganism, you will see that sexuality and occult go together always. 
prostitutions in their temples the prostitutes were in their temples why does the satan is so interested in your sexuality because sexuality is the most sacred and the most core thing about you it's something you share only with your spouse not with your kids not with your friends and not with your family it's the deepest and most sacred part about you when the Bible says that Adam knew his wife Eve, it uses the word know for sex. Meaning it's a way of knowing somebody on the level you cannot know anybody else. Your sexuality is so sacred, it's so protected, it's supposed to be so good and so shielded and sheltered from the world and everybody else. And that part is what the devil is after. That's why don't be surprised if he seeks to tell little children in school about anal sex and about all of these things. You know, how is that stuff that those kids shouldn't be hearing about that? Why is he going for the most sacred part? It's because he wants to mix, disturb, and he wants to disturb and pervert that part of our life. Israel was constantly being combated with these gods of the nations, these idols. One of the big bad boys that constantly Israel was tempted in worshiping was Baal. Baal was the God who constantly wanted to take the place of God of Israel. But Baal had a wife. Baal's wife was Ishtar. Ishtoreth is some other languages call it Ishtar. She was the seducer, seductress. She was the enchantress. She was the, the, the goddess of sex, the goddess of perversion, the goddess of whatever goes. And this Ishtar was what Israel sometimes would worship when they would step away from God. Now Ishtar and Baal had one more God. And that God that Israel even worshipped, it was Molech. Now Molech was the craziest out of the three because Molech demanded human sacrifice. And you would say, how in the world would someone offer somebody else to a God? It was very simple. This God Molech promised whoever offers a sacrifice to him, he would grant them fertility, rain upon their land and success in their life. So people would literally take their children and offer it to a demon idol of Molech believing he will give them rain and believing he will give them success in life. Now Jonathan Kahn wrote a book called The Return of the Gods and he highlights how these gods were expelled from the Greco-Roman culture. Because if you read about Greeks and Romans, Greeks and Romans practiced sexual immorality in a way that was as bad as Canaanites. Pedophilia, homosexuality was so common in those cultures. The kind of value humans had was little. The value that they placed on sexual exploitation and exploration was extremely high. With the advancement of Christianity, the gods of those nations, the Baal, the Baal, the Ishtoreth or Ishtar and Molech was put into exile. And this author, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, and I had an interview with him and he said this, that these gods now have returned to America. Because we departed from the truth. We moved our nation from the biblical foundation. Lines were blurred between animal and human. Animal life was elevated, human life was devalued. Today you can go to jail for hurting dolphins, but you don't go to jail for killing babies. Baal, was also, Baal also brought the idea that you can forge your own God, fashion your own truth and values. Absolutes don't exist, do as you please. When our nation, and I don't believe honestly that America is a Christian nation. Founding fathers didn't want this nation to be a Christian nation, but it was built on Judeo-Christian values and principles. It was built by Judeo-Christian values and principles where human life was valuable, where sexuality had its boundaries, perimeters and safeguards. Sodomy was not acceptable. 
a lot of other things that was not acceptable and then with time when the idea of God the Ten Commandments praying to God's protection was no longer constitutional and they were removed and labeled as unconstitutional I believe that Baal really took reign of American culture with Baal came Ishtar now Ishtar is the sexual perversion and revolution it's abandoning moral safeguards for instant gratification that brings fulfillment unrestrained sexuality no apparent thought of desire for or connection for children indulgences that lead to death sexual revolution severed marriages kids produced by sexual sin needed to be brought somewhere and now we had third God that came on the scene and that's Molech. Hitler killed six million Jews. Molech killed 60 million babies in our nation. City on the hill which what United States used to be became a blood-soaked high place for Molech. Children were offered on the altar of Molech. Women sacrificed children to gain favor with this God so that their grains would be fruitful, life will be blessed and prayers will be answered. Today in the United States having a child humpers your life. It takes your time, energy, education, hinders your career and it hinders your future earning capabilities. We have evangelists called celebrities who boast that they have found success in their careers after they ended the lives of unborn children. And they say that if you want to have a child, your dreams will be hindered. Molech just changed the face. He set up his headquarters in Planned Parenthood. And today it's the same unclean spirit. Look at this. In the old times, you offered your child so you can get success. Today, you get rid of your child so that child doesn't hinder your success. Molech came after Ishtar and the reason why abortion had to be necessary in the United States because when you allow sexual revolution which follows abandoning God, the truth and the high morals that God's Word teaches that, sexual revolution comes in and when you have sex that has no boundaries, you have babies that don't belong anywhere except at the altar of Molech. Our nation has exchanged God who is love for love who is God. Instead of enjoying sex, we worship sex. And therefore there is no boundaries, no safeguards. Love is love, President Barack Obama said. Love wins. There are people applying for a marriage license with their laptop. Why? Because love is love. Love decides what's right or what's wrong. For a Christian, God is love and God is good and He sets parameters on what is good. No parent in the right mind will let the child decide what is right or what is wrong based on the child's preference in that day. If the child gets a loaded AR, walks around and starts shooting at things and says, but I love it. The parent will say, oh yes, of course, let's make it legal for children to run around with ARs. There are certain rules, certain rights and wrongs that are established by a supreme being who we believe wants the best for us. He created the parks, the rivers, the oceans, abundance of seeds and fruits. He loves us. He doesn't wish harm upon us and He sets gifts to us. One of them is union between a man and a woman. God isn't homophobic, transphobic and other obic. God is simply a loving Father who does know better. And when we rebel against Him and we do what we want to do, we end up with another God that we create according to our lusts. But this God, if you think, oh no, He's no God. 
This is just us. It's not just us. The Bible is clear. That is us and them. And them, I'm not mean the bad people. I'm talking about the bad entities, principalities, powers. They all want something as well, as well as God does. God wants your happiness. He wants you to be holy. He wants you to be satisfied in His creation. He wants you to enjoy your life in the unity in your family. He wants husbands to love their wives, loves wives to love their husbands. He wants kids to grow up learning math and PE, not sexual orientation in third grade. He wants people to be happy and to love one another. He wants them to know the Creator and kill the snakes and scorpions aka demons. He doesn't want us to be slaves of our passions and to be prisoners of our desires. What happened in our culture and what's happening today, what I want us to be aware of is when God became replaced, sex became our God. And when sex became God, sex demands a sacrifice. And that sacrifice is children. Make no mistake, the devil is after children. Children are precious to God. The Bible says, if you cause any of the little ones to stumble, it will be better for you to tie a millstone around your neck and drown you in the deep sea. And these are not words from Moses or Elijah. These are words from sweet, precious Jesus. What does that mean? Any agenda, any plan that seeks the children to be confused, stumble and not know their Creator but bring mental illness and all kinds of mental health crisis and confuse them at the young tender age. Our Lord Jesus Christ says, it's better for you to tie a millstone around your neck and for you to drown. Why? Because children are precious. Children need to be protected children. The devil is after the children. Do you see when a lion attacks, what kind of gazelle he goes after? The younger they are, the greater they are the target. Parents, our children, the Lord has a plan for them. Jesus allowed children to come. One of the reasons that I'm speaking on this is because I want our children not to be brainwashed and indoctrinated. I want our children to have a sound mind. I want our children to grow up you know, a generation before created a wonder woman. Now, now we, don't, we wonder, what is a woman? <laughs> a previous generation sent people into the moon. Men went to the moon. Today, men go to the women's bathroom. That's our accomplishment. And it's twisted. It's, it's wrong. Our movies and our books everywhere on social media and people are rising up and saying, you know what? Even non-Christians. First, when I released a video about a year ago and I spoke kindly, but very firmly about what the Bible teaches. I honestly expected that would be the day that the funeral for my YouTube channel is going to be done. I was shocked with the amount of people that are not Christian who responded positively and saying, finally, thank you for speaking the truth. People who were living as practicing homosexuals and were married, who divorced after watching that video. I was surprised how many Muslim people have said, listen, I subscribe to your channel and I want to learn more about your faith now because of your stance because I knew that this was not right. It just didn't fit. It just didn't sit right. And I do believe that more and more people are beginning to rise up. It's a spiritual power that is at play, my friends. And the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, it deals with... now. I want to mention something about for those of you who think that this is not an agenda of lad this is just people getting their rights and you know you shouldn't be spending a Sunday and talking about this plus you know it might offend some people I understand your concerns and I understand for your fears I had a person tell me that they're gonna start praying for me because uh, there's a chance I might get shot and killed after I preach like that I'm like come on man as parody song by San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus said, and again, parody song, but I want you to notice in every humor, there's some truth. You think that will corrupt your kids if our agenda goes unchecked. Funny, just this once, you're correct. We'll convert your children. Happens bit by bit, quietly and subtly. 
and you will barely notice it. We're coming for your children. The gay agenda is here. I believe that there is a demonic agenda. I have no beef with homosexual, lesbian, or the alphabet community. I do believe the Lord loves every person, no matter what sin they commit or what they do, and God wants to forgive every person, and we love them as well. But I'm also not foolish and stupid, and nor should you be, that there is something else going on in our culture that the Bible makes it clear is a spiritual principality. That is behind the scenes, the way that this being pushed. And I'll give you this, these five steps that I believe is happening in this agenda. Number one, the first thing that this agenda had to accomplish is everyone coming out of the closet. Now, at first it may seem like, well, the, what, what is wrong with that? The basis of this is it teaches that sin is something you should be proud of. And you shouldn't be ashamed of sin. But the Bible says that we should be ashamed of our sin, but we shouldn't be ashamed of repentance. The Bible is very clear that a sinner shouldn't flaunt his sin and be proud of it. It's one thing when you're a sinner. It's another thing when you're a sinner and you're proud of it. But the culture really celebrates what the Bible tells us is not pleasing to God. Number two, this agenda goes to number two and that is to demand rights. Now you may say, well, everybody deserves to have the right. United States Declaration, Declaration of Independence document where we celebrate on July 4th when the United States was independent of the Great Britain. One of those things that says in that document is that we were given rights by God. Now let me ask you a question, very simple question. Does God ever give rights to sin? No. Now the nation can give civil rights to sin. For example, the nation can give rights to produce and to spread pornography. The nation can give rights to no-fault divorce. The nation can give rights, civil rights. But please understand, our document in the United States said our rights came from God. I will not find one verse in the Bible where God gives a right to murder, adultery, fornication, or behaviors that are not in line with His divine created order. And therefore to demand for rights, they don't come from God. Now at first in our nation, sodomy was actually punished by death until 1929 from 1624. In 1952, the American Journal of Health labeled homosexuality as a mental illness that can be treated. In 1953, our president Dwight Eisenhower actually didn't allow gay people to serve in the government labeling them as a security risk since they had, according to the medical journal, mental illness. It was actually until later on that Clinton introduced a law that says don't ask and don't tell. And of course Clinton had a lot of his skeletons in the closet. And then Barack Obama removed that don't ask and don't tell law in 2010. And we saw the United States started to move away from the laws that protected the purity and the marriage to the laws that started to protect more of a sin. The big shift that happened was in 1969 is where we get the gay month and the pride month. And that was on June 28th during the Stonewall riots. You have to understand is homosexuality was illegal. Practicing it could get you, at, uh, get you in jail. And police raided a bar, Stonewall Bar in New York City. And they arrest a lot of people there. And the homosexual community, as well as the community nearby that were not alphabet community, they decided to protest against the police. And for six days, they caused these riots. After that, every year from 1970 onward, in the United States, parades and celebrations were happening to commemorate the Stonewall riots. Until 1975, in San Francisco, there was a first time elected U.S. official who was openly gay, Harvey Milk, requested Gilbert Baker to create a flag or create a symbol to help this movement who is celebrating 
the Stonewall riots to have a symbol. And of course, this is where we get the flag. Gilbert Baker, and I'm going to quote what he said in his book concerning how he came up with the flag. A rainbow flag was a conscious choice, natural and necessary. The rainbow came from the earliest recorded history as a symbol of hope. In the book of Genesis, it appeared as a proof of covenant between God and all living creatures. It was also found in Chinese, Egyptian and Native American history. A rainbow flag would be our modern alternative to pink triangle. Now, why is he referring to pink triangle? Because pink triangle was the emblem of homosexual community until Gilbert created a new one. In fact, Hitler used pink triangle to identify gay people and he sent them with the Jews to be exterminated. And so Gilbert creates a different emblem or a symbol for the alphabet community. Now the writers who claimed their freedom at the Stonewall bar at 1969 would have their own symbol of liberation. And then of course we see that these rights get granted in 2015 when Barack Obama signs the legalization of the same-sex marriage. Number three step of this agenda, and I believe the principality is behind it, and that is to demand that you recognize the rights of the alphabet community. And when I say alphabet community, I don't mean it in a, in a way that's mean. It's just because letters keep getting added every single month that I just can't keep track of it. So I'm just gonna give that whole uh, community just an alphabet name. Number four is to take your rights. And we see what's happening today, what had happened with the swimmer guy who wasn't very good in his division until he decided to transition and of course he became exceptionally good competing against women. And it's Leah Thomas won a 500 yard freestyle swimming at NCAA championship. Even Mike Phillips, he said commenting on this win, he's like it will be equivalent to somebody using drugs to compete in a women's sports. We fought for women to have their dignity, have their opportunity. When women go to the bathroom in a gym or any store, they wanna get away from the prying eyes of men. Only to go to a place and find a person that claims to be someone else be there. And it's really, I believe it devalues women in our nation. It devalues girls who compete, who try their best, and the rights of other people are being infringed upon. And the last step of this agenda is where we're at right now, is to put everyone else who doesn't agree with this in the closet. Bend them, silence them, suspend them, label them with names that no Christian will ever be comfortable with because they're just untrue, and just call them with different things. Today, if you don't call somebody by their desired pronoun, it's an act of aggression. But think about it. US government law, First Amendment allows us to have freedom of speech. Meaning I have the right to speak what I believe is true. And if I speak something that is not true because I'm forced by you, I'm actually lying. I don't believe that a person's gender can be decided. This doesn't make me a bad person. I don't believe in that. I just believe in what the Bible teaches. I also believe what the bi biology teaches. So I follow the science. If I am forced to now lie about what I believe, just so you don't get your feelings hurt, my freedom is taken away to appease your lifestyle. And I believe that is not right. The scripture tells us that is not right. Because of what is happening today in our culture, I want to encourage you to let you know we are at war. Now, we're not at war with Target. We're not at war with Budweiser. We are at war with principalities. Ephesians 6 tell us how to deal with that. How do we deal with principalities? The first thing we must remember, things are more spiritual than they seem. If you think this is about the flag, 
the alphabet community this is principalities that are at war in our nation in fact the person that designed the clothing that target got a lot of backlash for on his instagram he said this satan respects pronouns is a fun way to show your pride a lot of lgbt people have found that christianity isn't always been most welcoming to them and they find solace and humor in the area or in the idea that satan would if you think for a moment that what is happening in our culture is just people trying to find freedom and not to be discriminated nobody is for other people being discriminated based on their race or based on their sexual orientation or whatever they want to do. Christians don't have a problem with that. What Christians have a problem for and what many people who are not Christians have a problem with is when that gets imposed on our children. When that gets imposed on us and when pastors are no longer allowed to talk about that because they quickly get threatened or penalized. That is where the problem is. Things are more spiritual. There are demonic forces. Why is that? Even on that image of Satan respects pronouns, you see Ouija boards, you see occultic practices. Why? It's because the devil is more behind it than you realize it. The second thing I want you to notice how we fight the spiritual principalities is we don't hate gay people. We don't hate people that are living that lifestyle. Why? Because I believe that they are in need of salvation the Bible teaches us as anybody else who doesn't know Jesus Christ and you don't hate the sinner the Bible tells us to love even our enemies and therefore we love people like that we welcome people like that and we are the people that the Lord wants to use that, that every person can have a chance to come to know Jesus Christ we're seeing more and more people coming out of that community and actually speaking out and saying, listen, I was tormented. I had to take the pills. I was doing that. But then I came to Jesus. I didn't like Jesus. I thought the church was just full of hate and full of that because the devil blinded me. But when I got born again, the gospel of Jesus Christ changed my life. Please understand that we don't have a problem like a doctor who accepts a patient that has a cancer. The doctor is at war with the cancer. When a sinner welcomes sin in their life, God wants to change the sinner. He wants to forgive the sinner. Whether that sin is rebelling against God and drugs, whether that sin is homosexuality, adultery, whatever it is, God wants to save a sinner. Amen. Number three is we take a stand. In Ephesians 6, Paul says, take a stand on the evil day. This is what happened, I believe, with Bud White. I don't drink alcohol, discourage Christians to drink alcohol, but when Bud White made a very bad marketing decision and put a guy, I think it's a guy, I forgot who, who um, I think it's a dude, um, Dylan, when they put over the advertising, what, what happened with people? Nobody went to hurt anybody, they just simply stopped buying things. When Target started to push something on a family store, what happened with Christians is a lot of them and even non-Christians who simply said, well Target will become a Target and we're just gonna stop shopping there. You can take a stand. A few things you can do. One is you take a stand with your dollar. When somebody blatantly, now there is no store right now in America who doesn't have some kind of a connection to the Pride Month. But when somebody flaunts and somebody begins to take huge pride and push that, you can choose to not shop there. It's your dollar. Secondly, you can choose to vote. That's your right. And when you vote for a politician who is on the payroll of God of Molech, you're not taking a stand. You can also speak God's truth in love. A lot of us are afraid. We're like, man, stay away from those topics because in social media, especially today, everyone is going to label you. But see, don't allow the enemy to silence you or to bully you. This doesn't give us permission to be nasty. This doesn't give us permission to be angry. And this doesn't give us permission to trash down people. But it still should not muzzle our mouth where now we're all cowardly afraid to speak about things that the Bible is very clear about because we don't want somebody over there on social media to think something of us. Take a stand. Even as a church, that's one of the reasons I want to have one service where we take a stand. 
You may say, well, Vlad, you're going to lose members. <sighs> First of all, this is not my church. Secondly, I don't get a chance. I, I don't have a luxury of choosing my own truth. It's God's truth. And another thing is that I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of a man loving a woman and having kids. I'm not ashamed of those things. Now, will that be labeled something by the culture? Culture can do whatever the culture will do. Roman was strong, Roman was no more. Greeks were big, Greeks were no more. America, if it keeps going this way, America one day will be no more. But this will endure. And I'm going to stand with this. I want you to stand with the scripture. Stand with the Bible. Stand for family. Stand for children. Stand for purity. Come on, those of you in the second century. Stand for righteousness. Stand for love. Stand for the cross. Stand for salvation. But there is one more thing that we need to do. You may take a seat. I still have a few minutes. The Bible doesn't just say to take a stand. And, but the Bible says something else we need to do. Put on the armor of God. A lot of us love to take a stand naked. What does this mean? Yeah, all those gay people. But what about those people that watch porn who are not gay? The armor of God is righteousness. You can't take a stand against what the enemy is doing naked. Meaning when it's easy to judge a sin you don't struggle with. It's easier to post about sin you don't need repentance from. Yeah, yeah those sinners, yeah those things. Well, homosexuality is a sin but so is looking with lust at a woman who is not your wife. But it's easy. What we do is we have mercy on the sins where we battle with and accept the sins that we don't struggle with. We need to take a stand. But the Bible also says wear the armor of God. Meaning wear righteousness, wear the truth, wear peace and wear helmet of salvation and, and then wear a shield of faith. I want to challenge us. May this be the month where as the culture is just getting a little bit more crazier that we just get a little bit more humble. We just get a little bit more pure. We just begin to grow hol holier in the Lord. Not holier than thou. Not with our nose up, but square our shoulders and lift our chin. You can square your shoulder and lift your chin without lifting your nose. You can walk in confidence without cockiness. You can walk in honor and humility at the same time. You don't have to hide away in fear. You don't have to be spineless snowflake. You can be a strong man and woman of God who walks in righteousness, who stands for purity and who stands for righteousness. Wear the armor of God. Wear purity, wear love and wear righteousness. Come on somebody. That means that your marriage shouldn't be cracking at the seams. Your marriage should be strong. Because that's what we wear to this world. Nothing is worse than Christians saying, yeah, this is wrong and this is wrong. And you look at their life and it's as bad as the things that they attack. The Bible says to stand against principalities. We're not at war with people. We're at war with principalities. We're called to save people. Now, I'm at war with strongholds. What I'm speaking right now, I'm destroying strongholds. I'm not destroying people. Now if you're married to your stronghold, it will feel like I'm attacking you. But I'm not attacking you. I'm just attacking a belief system that is not in line with God's Word. That's a spiritual warfare that is taking place in our mind. But the Bible says that a Christian fights a spiritual principality by putting on something that the world does not appreciate. But it has one more thing in Ephesians chapter 6. Paul ends this whole thing about spiritual warfare with principalities and he said praying with all prayer and supplication. What does that mean? If you have children that are maybe went into a gay lifestyle or you have children maybe that have transitioned. I want to tell you something. Number one, you must understand things are more spiritual than you realize. Number two, I want you to realize hating them First of all, that is not what God calls us to do. God calls us to love your neighbor. Your kids, your family members, your brothers and sisters, they're part of that second commandment is to love them. The third thing is you live in a way that glorifies God. But the fourth thing is that 
we have to take a stand, meaning don't back down. Don't think that, oh, I'm just going to change my stance and I'm just going to really try to accept them and affirm them and approve of them and that's going to change them. People don't change because we change the Bible. That's really what it is. When you think that loving somebody means approving what the Bible says is not right, that's not loving them. A year ago, I had blood work done and my doctor came to me and she said words that I've never thought I'll hear. She said, you have high cholesterol. I said, excuse me? I said, you got some other patient. That's not me. And I was like, where is this coming from? She's like, you have more weight than normal. I said, excuse me? I mean, thinking I was like, are you, are, you, are you kidding me? I mean, was I offended? You bet. Did I ever thought that I had extra, I picked up extra weight? No. Everybody maybe, not me. I'm fine. But see, blood work doesn't lie. And it doesn't care about my feelings. My doctor didn't care about my feelings. She cared about my health. Of course, she wanted to prescribe me medicine. And I said, okay, what is the alternative to this medicine? She's like, well, you just need to shave off 15 pounds. And I said, doctor, you got it. See, when God's word comes and tells you the truth, it's going to set you free. But it will offend you before it sets you free. And if you can take on the offense and say, you know what? God is, doesn't hate me. My doctor, I know she said that I have high cholesterol with a smile, but it didn't feel like she was happy. I felt like she was attacking me. And it maybe it feels like that man, he's just, he's just attacking. No, this is, there is just an issue that the scripture diagnoses us and Jesus is a good doctor. He says, hey, I care about your health. I care about your eternity. So as Christians, I want you to take a stand. Don't think that just because you accept somebody, you have to approve of that. Parents, you don't have to approve. When your kid takes drugs, you can love them without approving drug addiction. You can love them without approving alcohol addiction and say, hey, listen, I don't agree with that. This is not right. And you can still love them. Don't let anybody bully you that if you tell the truth, that means that you don't love a person. That is the furthest thing from the truth. And ever since last year, you know, I started to lose just a little bit, very slowly, weight. And I'm believing I'm going to go see the doctor again this year and I'm going to have a good news. Yeah. And I'll tell you next year about it. But there's one thing that every parent, every brother and sister can do. If you have somebody who is today struggling and they are convinced that's how God made them to be, is you can pray. The Bible says pray. You may say, my words don't reach them. There is something that can reach them that is stronger than your words. It's your prayer. And Paul says, pray with all supplication. Pray for your family. Pray for them. Pray that God will bring their hearts to salvation and don't give up on them. The harder they go deeper into that lifestyle, it, please understand, you already have somebody helping them, the Holy Spirit, who's going to try to guide them away from that. The sin only brings punishment, so it will bring uneasiness and shame to their conscience and your prayer will allow the Holy Spirit, God's angels, to move further and further, to deeper and deeper move them toward the gospel. What our brother shared today, when his sister prayed, he did six times, but God brought in out of all the people, not an evangelist, he used an evangelist who is a sheriff, least likely evangelist. Those evangelist sheriffs, they usually lock you up. But this one brought him freedom. Why? Because God will answer your prayer. God will answer your fasting if you do it. Amen. In the conclusion, the rainbow. The rainbow, unlike Gilbert, who created that rainbow, Gilbert Baker, who said that this is a symbol of hope. The Bible tells us that the rainbow was God's symbol. And I'm just going to highlight a few things about the rainbow. Now the real rainbow, the physical rainbow, is simply the sun shining through the raindrops. When the rain is going on, the sun is getting through. There's a specific angle that the sun rays are going through. And then what we see is what we call the rainbow. The first time the rainbow appeared in the Bible, we see that, hap that happened after Noah's flood. Now I want to remind you, God has a rainbow on His throne. But there is no rain there. So I don't know how He does it. So for those people who are like, man, even God has the gay flag. He does have a rainbow. It has nothing to do with pride. It has nothing to do with promoting 
homosexuality. We see Noah after the flood. Few things I want you to highlight. One is that God, God, don't mistake in God's patience for God's approval. God was waiting for 120 years for people to repent. For 120 years when Noah was building an ark, God was giving people a chance to repent and they didn't. And when the ark was finished, God still gave them seven more days in case they could change their mind. If your idea is that God is this cranky, moody, vengeful, can't wait to just squash and kill people. He just loves, he just like war. I want to let you know that it came from the world, not from the scriptures. Our God is slow to anger. He is patient. The Bible says He is very patient so that people can have a chance to repent. 120 years, He wasn't punishing anybody, saying, people, come on, please repent. Please repent. Forgive. I mean, repent and to change your ways. An ark was built. God is saying the rain is going to come. People have never seen the rain. Most likely, the earth had in the atmosphere some kind of a water circle which allowed us to live forever and so that this this sun rays were not coming through that as we have it today and so God is promising all of that probably will break flood will come people are like no that's not gonna happen God is giving people repent a chance to repent this is the problem with God's patience we think God's patience is God's approval when punishment doesn't happen we think I got away with it or God changed his mind the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, because the sentence against evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set on doing evil. Remember, just because God gives us a free choice, it does not mean we are free from the consequences those choices bring. The second thing I want you to see from the rainbow story is that God provided the way of salvation and there was only one way and that was a ship. There was no other way a man could be saved from God's judgment and God's punishment. If the word judgment, wrath is a trigger word for you, trust me, you wouldn't want a God who is not just. When you're the one that's being sinned against, you wouldn't want a judge who like, yeah, oh, this person killed your family member. They didn't mean it. Case dismissed. Nobody wants a judge that's not just because then they are not good and they're not to be trusted. You want a God that's just, that's holy, that's good, and that's loving. Yeah, yeah. Can somebody say amen? amen. In the second sanctuary, can you say amen? amen? And God provides an ark to save Noah. Noah builds this ark out of wood. For us, God provided the cross of Jesus Christ to save us. This ark, it took the beating of all the flood and all the rain. Jesus Christ took all of the wrath of God upon Himself. He absorbed the punishment for our sin upon Himself. This ark had only one door and Jesus says, I am the door to the sheep. This ark only had one window and the Christians have only one book called the Bible, which is where the light of God comes through. And through this book, we see into another realm and into eternity because this is the window into the eternity. The ark only had one family. In God's house in Jesus we are one family. Latino, green, white, black, young and old. No matter what you are, when you are in Christ we are one family. That's why there is no racism in God's family. That's why there's no discrimination in God's family because we are one in Him. Jesus is the ark. The third thing I want you to notice is that God didn't tolerate sin. He punished it. And again, if that triggers somebody, I want you to notice as a Christian, if we water down the meaning of sin, we water down the sacrifice that paid for it. If we say sin is not a big deal, Vlad, don't, 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 don't preach it's a big deal. If I preach that sin is not a big deal, I automatically have to agree the cross wasn't a big deal. The blood didn't matter. The sacrifice wasn't that valuable. Jesus' is suffering, eh, it wasn't a big deal. He just took a few beats. A few, few, some people just punched him. It wasn't a big deal. No, my friend, it was a big deal. His sacrifice was a sacrifice that it was a big deal. Why? Because the sin is a big deal. Number four, God proclaims peace to the saved people through the rainbow. Interestingly, the word rainbow in the original Hebrew is actually a word for a bow. In other words, the Hebrew and Jewish scholars were saying when after God punished sin and saved a one family of eight people they came out of that boat that saved them from God's wrath and God takes his bow and he puts it down he lays down that bow declaring 
war is over sin is punished we can have peace now we can have relationship i'm no longer going to punish you why because the sin was already punished what the creator of the gay flag missed is that god didn't put his bow until he punished sin god doesn't give peace until sin is punished not tolerated overlooked or minimized if you think that our god who they sing for eternity not god is love god is love god is love they say holy holy is the lord god almighty one of his strongest attributes that we will glorify for eternity is his holiness god cannot have peace with us until sin is dealt with his holiness won't allow a relationship. That's why 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on a cross. He absorbed the sin of humanity. So God can put the bow down and say, now I can have peace with humanity. Now I will no longer punish their sins because they were punished on the cross. Can somebody give God some praise for the cross? Can somebody give God some praise for the blood? Can somebody give God some praise for Jesus' death, burial and resurrection? And the last thing is the world has turned the rainbow into an act of provocation. So God takes the bow and puts it down meaning it's kind of like somebody who holds a gun against you and then they put it down in their hostel they they put it down Whew, the situation got de-escalated everything is fine i see this bow that was put down as a way of saying we're good this bow humanity now uses to pull the arrow called pride against god because guess what symbol do we use against God? And that is the symbol He used of mercy. We use it now as a provocation. And what gives us the audacity to do that? It's very simple. Pride. It turned Lucifer into a devil. And it turns us into rebels. Satan doesn't mind that we don't worship Satan. We don't have to believe in Him if we behave like Him. Satan didn't become Satan by doing Ouija boards. He became Satan by pride. When we allow pride in our life, meaning God, I know better for me, not what you say. Guess what begins to happen? God's gifts to us get abused, twisted. And it's an act of provocation to him. You may say, oh, but Vlad, these people aren't provoking God. They're just doing whatever they want to do. That's what they think. But in the realm of the Spirit, it's a creation that's provoking God to even greater anger. I really believe this may sound a little bit Debbie the Downer. We live in Sodom and Gomorrah. Things were not the same a hundred years ago. So you and I are like Lot and his family and what I want to encourage you today is not to cave to the culture. Stand tall. Stand strong. But I believe there's more than 10 of us here. God didn't punish. God punished Sodom because there was not enough people. But I believe there's a lot of people in the United States. But even if not in the United States, there's going to be people in Tri-Cities who will love God, love people, and it will stand for the truth. And we might not be big, but the salt, when you throw salt into soup, you don't throw big chunks. It's the little one. It's the little bit that makes a big difference. So we don't have to be big to make a big difference because we will help the poor. We will deliver the captives. We'll pray for healing. We will win our friends and family one by one and we will weaken the principality strongholds. And if we will be required to lay our life for this, we will lay our life for this. I want to let you know when Lot, see Noah was saved eight people. Lot was saved four people. And when they were getting out of Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot's wife looked back. I just want to speak to those of you who are Christians today. Don't look back. Don't look back to that lifestyle. 
Don't look back and say, you know what, but Vlad, I don't want to be counted as weird. I don't want to be labeled as, you know, you shouldn't live by world's approval of you. People's opinions of you should not define who you are. If you cave into that and you let what everybody thinks of you decide what you believe, what are you going to say in the last day when you stand before God? Don't live for the approval of men. Don't live for the approval of your friends. And some of us might even lose some friends, lose some followers, lose our reputation. But at the same time, I'll rather lose it for Jesus than lose it because I am a sinner. I'd rather lose it because I stood for the truth than lose it because I stood in immorality, I defrauded somebody financially, I practiced adultery and everything. But to suffer for because you believe in Jesus and you love people, that is a noble thing. And the Bible says, blessed are you when they persecute you for righteousness sake. See, some of us were only persecuted for drugs. Some of us were only persecuted for adultery. But today is going to be coming a day where some of us will experience some minor levels of persecution, some more levels of persecution and we should embrace it. Now if you're persecuted because you're brush, you're mean and you're nasty, no that's not biblical persecution. Biblical persecution is you love Jesus, you love people and you stand for the things that are not popular but you still stand. And you don't turn your back and try to cave to the world and you're willing to pay whatever price your Savior paid in rescuing you, that you paid that price in following Him. My great-grandpa, the Soviets told him, you can't preach anymore. And guess what he did? They said he had children. They said, we will take you and arrest you, which meant nobody will feed the children because the men were the breadwinners. So imagine looking at your children knowing all I have to do is believe in God here and never talk about Him. I mean, why do I have to put my family in danger? But you know, the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. He talked about Jesus and it got him locked up for 10 years. And God took care of his kids. One of them was my grandma, whom you see in the church today. God took care of her. Not only God took care of them, they had enough to send to prison so that my grandpa could break those crackers to other prisoners and lead them to Christ. Wow. Soviet Union labeled anybody who believed in God as morons, underdeveloped and stupid. They didn't allow anybody who believed in God to go get educated so that they can keep their propaganda that the reason why you believe in God is because you're not educated. But you can't get educated because you believe in God. My grandpa got out of prison, great grandpa got out of prison. Life was good at first until one day him and his friend were walking by and Soviet Union guys, especially the ones in the village were riding on the horse and they had this wagon that was there and they forced them to jump, jump on the wagon. As my great-grandfather and his friend jumped on the wagon, they started to beat them with ropes. And so my grandfather's great-grandfather's friend quickly jumped and ran. My great-grandfather was about to jump but his foot got stuck in the wagon. So his body jumped out, his foot got stuck there. Instead of stopping, they kept on beating him except from the top of the wagon as his body was being hit on the gravel. This went on for 40 minutes. They kept circling town until he went unconscious. Thankfully, they dropped him off at the local hospital. He did come back to his senses. The only problem, he was never the same. There was a permanent damage and after that, he died shortly. He faced communism. It was an onslaught of abortion, murder, greed and craziness. Today we're facing something else. Our price is losing Instagram, Facebook, maybe get few hate letters. But I want to encourage us to stand strong for God. 
for purity, for good marriages. Let's, let's stand for our children. Don't let your children be brainwashed by the culture. Raise them in admonition of the Lord. Bring them to church. Send them to camps. Bring them to youth service. And read the Bible with your children. Don't let TikTok disciple them. Let the Word of God disciple them. Man, commit your eyes to purity. Commit your hearts to your wives. Let's stand in opposition, in rebellion against the perversion, adultery, fornication and the immorality of our generation. In Jesus' name. Let's redeem the rainbow. Rainbow means mercy after the sin is punished. We've been delivered from death, sin and we've been delivered from the penalty of sin, the power of sin and one day we're going to be delivered from the presence of sin. God gives us the rainbow of His mercy and readiness to us. Amen. Thanks for watching this sermon. If this was a blessing to you, would you let me know in the comments below what stood out to you from this message? What are you taking home with you from this message? Also, if you enjoyed these messages, would you help us and hit thumbs up to this video and subscribe to our channel so you can get new videos every single week delivered to you on your YouTube app. If you go to hungrygen.com forward slash sermons, you'll actually be able to download the transcript, the notes and the quotes of this sermon and the rest of all of our sermons free of charge. Until next time.